I know that song's a little bit uh, unfamiliar to some of you, but it's a really great kind of Reformation truth song about the power of the Word of God. Um, funny, I, I, last year I was hiking, and um, I don't know why, but the group was ahead of me. And when I'm hiking alone, I often sing songs to ward off the bears. <laughs> and I was singing that song. Uh, and when I got to the end, the Holy Spirit, light reveal, I was really going for it in the woods. Um, and I realized when I finished that there was a husband and wife that had been hiking behind me for um, the majority of all four verses, actually. Um, and, they, and I stopped singing, and they said, well, we really enjoyed that. And I said, well, thanks. It was... <laughs> Well, it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be for everybody. Um, we're looking today at the Reformation, what it means for our lives today. What could an event that happened 502 years ago have to do with you today? A lot, actually, I think. A lot, and it's worth considering and worth thinking about the truths uh, that came through the Reformation uh, that harken back to the truths that were there from the beginning in Jesus Christ, that were there in the early church from the very start and are the foundation of our faith. I want to walk through just four today that I think are really, really um, powerful for me to think about when I think about what does it mean to live the Reformation today, Okay. A uh, very famous Catholic uh, theologian named Richard John Newhouse uh, died a couple years ago. He said this uh, about Protestants. He said this. He said, if you don't know why you're not Roman Catholic, then you don't know why you are a Protestant. Okay? Which is kind of true, actually. Uh, the Reformation was... Uh, a protest against the Catholic Church for some of the egregious ways that ha they had erred away from the Word of God. And uh, Martin Luther made those known uh, kind of in short order in a profound way on 1517 when he nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg. This guy, Martin Luther, was a... Uh, an Augustinian monk uh, who ha was really struggling with some of the teachings of the church and how they fit with the teachings of the scriptures. And so um, he posted these theses, which were meant for debate, uh, that the church might read and talk about. Um, and this started a storm uh, of, that had been long brewing in many ways, but that Martin Luther and many other reformers led to call the church back to the pure teachings of the word of God so that they might live in the comfort and the promises of God and in the true law and gospel that the, that the, that the scriptures proclaim. Okay, So the Reformation was a lot of different things. It was huge, broad-spanning uh, now for about 500 years. It changed the fabric of society and of the church and of the individual. Okay, And we're going to talk today about just some of the ways that the Reformation reshapes our lives and how I want it to reshape you. Okay, The first way is that the Reformation is, first and foremost, a Reformation of the heart. Okay? A reformation of the heart. So Luther, in the 95 Theses that he nailed to the church door in Wittenberg, one of them said this, that repentance was not just an individual act. Okay? It wasn't us like sitting and enumerating all of the sins that we've done, but is a lifestyle. Okay? It is a lifestyle of turning back towards God and calling on him for forgiveness and life and calling on us for repentance uh, and, and humility. So this is one of the things that, they, that he says. He says this, if you want to be saved and to be a Christian, then stay open to correction. Preachers have to rebuke or they should leave their positions. The Christian who won't accept correction is only really pretending to be a Christian. I, and that's, that's true. If I found anything out about being a Christian, okay, from the time I was little until now, 
is that you regularly find out that you're wrong about things, okay? You regularly are confronted by the word of God, which calls you to faith, which, which calls you to repentance, which calls you to action, which calls you to humility. And so Martin Luther gives a fine, fine piece of advice about what it means to be a Christian is to be opened to being reformed. This is what he's saying, to be open to be, being corrected, for to be open to God reshaping you and reworking you. Think about, for example, um, what a, um, a mason does or what a sculptor does. A sculptor has in his mind an idea of a beautiful image. Uh, I think, um, I heard a sculptor say once, when he looks at a piece of rock, he sees what shouldn't be there and takes it away, right? And kind of hatches it away until finally he sees what he has kind of in his own mind's eye is the perfect image of what he's seeking. That's much how God works in our lives through his word. God is our sculptor, our shaper, the potter who molds us and mends us uh, and works in us for his good pleasure. So what it means to be a Christian is to continually be reforming our hearts, to continually be working and listening to the word of God and letting it shape us and renew us and change us. Recognizing that it's not our own good works, it's not our actions, uh, it's not our own... Um, it's not our own kind of list or repertoire of the good things that we've done that has saved us, but God in his saving actions that saves us. So Martin Luther says this, too. He says, it's faith without good works, prior to good works, and even in spite of our good works that takes us to heaven. We come to God through faith alone. What's the, the, the famous line um, nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross I cling. That's the truth for us, right? What it means to be a Christian, what it means to live as a Reformation era Protestant, a Lutheran, a Christian. It means to be constantly reforming our own hearts, constantly saying, I'm not good enough, but you are. It's not my works, but it's yours. So some have described the Reformation in this way, which I think is a very, very powerful way to describe the Reformation. They'll say, uh, the Reformation taught us that you are saved by works, just not yours. That's a profound thing to think about, right? That you're saved by works. They're just not yours. They're Christ's on your behalf, given to you as a gift. And that truth and that reality, when we live in that, that is where true freedom comes. Martin Luther, if you don't know his story, was a man that was just plagued by his own sin, plagued by the fact that he just couldn't stack up, couldn't, do, couldn't climb the ladder to heaven. He was always falling off, always messed up, was never righteous enough to stand before God until he received until he learned this truth, that you're saved by works, but they're not yours. They're Christ's for you, which is a really, really profound thing for us to think about on this Reformation Day. So if I, if I want you to live by anything, right, if I want you to be changed by anything as a Christian, it's this truth, that you are free in Christ because of what he has done not because of what you have done. You are forgiven in Christ, not because of what you have done, but because of what he has done. That's the reformation of the heart for us. So uh, Romans, the Apostle Paul says it this way, for the wages of sin is death. And it doesn't say uh, 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 multiple sins or a certain amount of sins, but just says sin in general. The wages of that is death. But the gift of God the gift through, that comes through Christ Jesus and his saving work is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the heart and soul of the Reformation. Now, there were other things that were reformed in beautiful ways uh, in, uh, during the Reformation. The family as well was reformed. Um, so 
uh, we've been going through the small catechism. And if you've ever held the small catechism in your hand, it's like 30 pages long, and it's one of the first things that Martin Luther ever wrote for the church. So when he was kind of a pastor and a theologian, he did this traveling uh, tour through uh, the, the, the churches and the families and homes of Germany. And as he traveled through them, he found them in great disrepair. Okay. Fair, uh, very, very few Christians knew anything about the Bible. Very few pastors were teaching the truths of the Word of God. They couldn't recite the Ten Commandments. They couldn't recite the creeds. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't recite the Lord's Prayer. And they didn't know what it meant for their life or for their faith. And so he wrote this little document called Luther's Small Catechism that was meant for pastors and it was meant for fathers and mothers in order to change the home, okay? So he, uh, uh, at, the, at the heading of all the small catechisms, it says this, as the head of the household should teach his family in a simple way, right? And he gave them this little 30-page document that went all throughout the world and is still one of the most published little documents of the Reformation era. And Martin Luther said, fathers, mothers, take this document seriously, Teach it to your family. Teach it to your children. Talk to them. Share it with them. And they will be changed and you will know the truths of the word of God. I think if there is anything that is going to carry the church into the future, right? It's us taking this little command seriously. As the head of the household, as the head of the family should teach his children and his household in a simple way, the faith. There is, there is a small kind of cottage industry around what's going to make churches grow in our world. Is it lights? Is it certain types of music? Is it, uh, is it pastors that look a certain way? Is it a certain preaching style? Is it, uh, is it churches that meet in movie theaters? Is it churches that meet in, in big cathedrals? Luther would say no. If anything is going to change and grow the church, it's the small, tiny acts of fathers and mothers who gather daily and nightly with their children to say, do you want to know what Jesus has done for us? Do you want to know what the word of God directs us and how to live and how to follow him and how to trust in him? Let's sit down and learn together. That is what will change the church. Far and away. You can leave all the other stuff behind. If you have it, that's okay, but don't put your eggs in that basket. You want to change the church, do it through the family. And the, the Reformation era saw that and saw that we can change the world through fathers and mothers, through children and families, learning to proclaim and believe in the word of God. So if you're going to be a Reformation era Christian, you're going to live the Reformation today then tonight, sit down with your family, sit down with your husband, sit down with your wife, sit down with your children and say, hey, can we read the word of God together and talk about what it means for us? That is the Reformation. That's living the Reformation. Not only was the family uh, reformed during this era, but also the church was, uh, was reformed. So uh, Luther says this, God's people and the church are those who rely on nothing else than God's grace and mercy. And Luther went to painstaking efforts, along with many other reformers, to change the way that church happened. You may not think about this very often, um, but do you know that the reason you sing hymns, or the reason that we sing in church, is because of the reformers? Because of somebody 500 years ago that said, hey, the people of God should get to sing the truths of God. And when you used to come to church 600 years ago, you would passively sit and watch. It was kind of a spectacle. You'd sit and share and think, okay, well, I I've seen church. I've listened to church. I've been there. That's it. But the reformers said, no, 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 no. The church is the gathered people of God proclaiming the truths of God. And so they would write hymns. And you can, can look through our hymnals or, or countless other hymnals and see how many hymns come from the last 500 years because that's when the church really began to sing together. And that's why we started today with uh, that old, uh, it's, it's not my favorite hymn in the world, but a mighty fortress is our God. That's Martin Luther. 
who said, let's give the church something to sing about, okay? Other ways the church was changed was through preaching. Did you know that the majority of uh, the church service 600 years ago took place in a language that you could not understand? It was spoken and preached and taught almost primarily in Latin throughout all churches, okay? And uh, Luther and the other reformers, when they gathered, they said, the word of God is for the people of God. If they can't understand it, then what's the point? So they did things like translate the Bible. They did things like making preaching and the sacraments the center of worship to say the people must know and hear the word of God because that is what changes hearts and individuals. And so preaching and teaching became one of the central things for the church. So if you're going to be a Reformation era Christian, living out uh, your faith in this day and age, read your scriptures. Come to church. Proclaim the faith together. I've always liked this, um, this definition that we get from, uh, from some of the reformers on what the church is. It says this. We teach that the one holy church is to continue forever. The church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. What I really like about this definition of the church is it's just bare minimum. I tell our choir sometimes, and you'll hear me say sometimes, you don't need nearly anything to do church together. What do you need to be the church? Well, we need you for one. We need the word of God for two. And we need the sacraments that we gather around, right? You can do church anywhere with those things. And that's a beautiful thing to think about. That you can be in the greatest cathedral in all the world, and if you have those three things, guess what? You have church. You can be, uh, I like to say, uh, a chaplain who flips over a milk crate in the middle of Afghanistan and opens his scriptures and lays out the sacraments and gathers people, uh, soldiers or individuals, to hear the word of God. Guess what? That is church. You can be in a house, you can be in a field, you can be in a barn, you can be wherever. If you have those three things, guess what? You have church. So you don't need seats, you don't need buildings, you don't need pianos, you don't need microphones, you don't need candles, you don't need any of that stuff. Ultimately, the church is made up of three things. The people, the word, and the sacraments. And that is what the church has always gathered around and is the heart and center of the church. So, if you're going to be a Reformation era Christian, engage with those three things. The word, the people of God, and the sacraments. Lastly, and maybe kind of most beautifully, uh, the Reformation changed the way that we think about society. 500 years ago, if you were to say, who are the kind of like up and ups in society? And who are the lowdowns? There was a clear distinction between classes. The people on the upper end were religious folk. If you wanted to be uh, kind of high and mighty in God's eyes, you became a pastor, or you became a priest, or you became a monk, or you became a nun. And then you were a little bit closer to God. But if you were a farmer, or a maid, or a father, or just a normal mother, well then you were kind of low on the barrel, right? But Luther flipped that, and the other reformers flipped that on its head, going back to the clear teachings of the Word of God. This is a great quote. Every occupation has its own honor before God. Ordinary work is a divine vocation or calling. In our daily work, no matter how important or mundane, we serve God by serving the neighbor. And we also participate in God's ongoing providence for the human race. Okay? So you have these two people. You have a priest or a pastor dressed up in nice garb. He seems very holy. He seems very close to God. He's got, uh, he's got fancy clothes on. He has a fancy chalice in front of him. You've got a mother down there who is very dangerously changing a diaper in a white shirt. And Luther would say that she is closer to God than the priest or the pastor. Why? Because she is sustaining the life, even though it seems mundane, 
right? Even though, it's, even though you're down in the literal muck and the mire and the smell of life, you know? Luther's saying that she is the hands of God providing exactly what that child needs to sustain his or her life. How is that not the most important job? How is that not a high and mighty and great job? So um, Luther used to commend to dads. He used to say, if you want to get in on some of the greatest work of God, then get down and change the diaper or clean up the messes of your child because you are participating in some of the finest work of God. So if you want to be a Reformation-era Christian, think about this. Whatever you are doing, you can be serving as the hands and feet of God through your vocation. Are you a teacher? Are you a father, a mother, a grandmother? Are you a mechanic? Are you a pastor? Are you a Sunday school teacher? You are the hands and feet of God doing his work in the world as his tools and instruments for his glory. And when we begin to see ourselves and our callings that way, man, it gives them a new life, right? To not say, oh, it's just my job. Oh, I'm so tired of doing this. But instead to say, I am an instrument in the hands and feet of God to care for this person or to do this job for his glory. That's a truly Reformation era Christian. So the Reformation continues today, okay? We are constantly reforming our hearts and being changed into the likeness of God. We are consistently sharing the word of God with our family to see change and reformation in them and in us. We are living out the Reformation truths and hearing them and proclaiming them in the church. And in society, we remain and live as the hands and feet of God serving our neighbor. May the Reformation continue until the Lord returns in our lives as a church and in your lives individually. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are the great reformer, the great changer, the great sculptor, the great potter. Would you uh, help us to live in the reformation truth and freedom that your son Jesus has given us? May our hearts be changed, may our families be changed, may our church be changed, may our society be changed by your ever-living and constant word. In your name we pray. Amen.